Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Buddhist Mahavira Facebook Live and Facebook sharing here tonight. And tonight's sharing is a Dharma sharing by Aya Suvira entitled Pure Bliss Theory and Practice of Joy in Buddhism based on the Abhidharma and commentaries. So before that, we would also like to encourage everyone to also remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel because in our YouTube channel, we have more than 200 Dharma sharing talks there where you can also refer them and watch them in your own convenience. So for those of you sharing here, very good evening to all of you. And right now we would like to also invite Aya Sivira here. So ladies and gentlemen, Aya Suvira is a Buddhist nun, a bhikkhuni in the Theravada tradition and a student of Bhante Sujato. She received her seminary ordination in 2016 and higher ordination as a bhikkhuni at the Dhammasara Nuns Monastery in 2019 with Aya Santini of Indonesia as preceptor and Ajahn Brahm as instructing teacher. At present, she works on Sutta Central related projects dealing with Sutta parallels in Sanskrit. With the support of Bante Sujato and Tina Ng and a team of the Matar Center Metarama Working Group, she's continuing the vision of the Metarama project to provide an urban residence for nuns in Sydney. Aya Subira is fluent in English and Mandarin. So tonight, we'll be hearing a Dharma sharing about pure bliss, the theory and practice of joy in Buddhism based on the Abhidharma and commentaries. Over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Sister Vivian. So before we start for this evening, um, let's say Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa So I'm very happy to be here this evening. Um, it's just after 11.30 p.m. our time, but you know, I don't mind so much because actually I'm just really happy um, to be with everyone. So before we um, get into things, um, I'd just like to invite everyone to do a little bit of metta meditation to get us started. Um, because you know, when we do metta, it puts us in a good mood to listen to the talk. Um, and, you know, it also puts me in a good mood too towards, um, you know, all of the participants. So we can start from a really happy, positive, metaphor place. So to do the metta meditation, we'll make our bodies comfortable wherever we're sitting right now. We can put our hands in our laps. And gently close our eyes. We can gently continue to breathe in and out while thinking the words of metta. May I be well, may I be happy, may I be at peace. So we can continue to do this silently for the next minute. Just sending all the warm, positive feelings of friendship and acceptance to ourselves. From the tops of our heads 
right down to our toes. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be at peace. Now that we have developed metta for ourselves, we can spread the metta to the other people in our lives, to our friends, to our relatives, to people we don't know very well. And we can quietly think the words of metta to ourselves. May they be well. May they be happy. May they be at peace. So just focusing on the warm, gentle feeling of metta. May they be well. May they be happy. May they be at peace. And finally, we can wish sincerely for the well being of the whole world. May the whole world be well. May the whole world be happy. May the whole world be at peace. So we can relax our hands and gently open our eyes and come back to the BMV Dharma Dana program. So I'm joining you for the second time this evening. Um, I had the pleasure of joining you all previously. Um, last time we looked at the topic of joy in the Sutta Pitika. And, you know, I thought, okay, we'll make this, you know, round it out. And I'll do the second sharing. Um, on the topic of joy in the Abhidhamma and commentaries. Um, I'm not actually an Abhidhamma teacher, so if anyone came, you know, thinking that Ayasavira is going to teach the Patana, you know, I, I hope you're not disappointed. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to talk about joy um, in the Abhidhamma and commentaries is, is mainly just something from my own inspiration because... Um, uh, Brother Tilak, you know, he said to me, um, you know, to pick the topic. So I thought, okay, I'll pick something that I, I think is personally inspiring. So the reason 
um, I wanted to talk about joy in the Abhidharma is actually because I had an interest in um, in how um, you know the Abhidharma actually interacts with meditation techniques. And I was feeling um, very inspired by a particular academic paper from 2014, which was by Andrew Skilton and people um, Chum Po'o Pai Sal called The Old Meditation at Wat Ratchasitaram in Tamburi in Thailand. So what's actually meant by the old meditation? Um, actually, it's something called Buran Kamatana. You know, Buran meaning old in Thai and Kamatana obviously being like a meditation object or a topic of meditation. So, so you know, sometimes the people think of the Abhidharma as, you know, as only being a scholastic text. But if we look at, um, you know, historical meditation methods that existed prior to the 20th century um, in places like Thailand and Sri Lanka, um, we see Abhidharma concepts being used as part of, um, you know, a method of teaching um, samatha or or calm meditation, which to me is quite interesting. And it's not actually something I really knew a lot about beforehand. So that's why I thought, okay, um, you know, if I give a talk, it has to be interesting to me as well too. So I thought it might be a good chance to look at um, the way the concept of um, chaitasikas or mental factors, aka mental concomitants from the Abhidharma relates to meditation practice and teaching, um, which is a little bit unusual for me. But, you know, I thought if it's something a bit interesting, at least, you know, that'll help keep me awake, um, even though it's going to be midnight here. So the way um, these pre-modern meditation systems worked is you have this concept of a cycle of meditation topics. So in this particular version, the entry to the cycle was by contemplating the lessons relating to the Buddha's virtue. So um, in these particular um, you know, pre-modern texts, the, um, you know, the entry point um, is again joy, it, it's pithi. So you know, the, five, the five kinds of pithi from the Visuddhimagga are there up front, and we'll be talking about those a little bit later today. And then the next entry point is the six pairs or the um, six yugala from the Abhidharma, which again I'll be talking about um, very soon. And you know the third entry point is um, what's called the two sukha samadhi, um, being kaya sukha and chitta sukha, so bodily and mental happiness. So I thought, okay, that's really interesting too that um, we have these meditation systems that are really putting happiness and joy um, as the gateway. So now I've told you what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I think I should keep moving on to the content. So I have my screen up and you know, when we look at this, this concept of the yugalas or these pairs of chaitasikas, in the Abhidharma. Actually, you know, they didn't just come from nowhere to actually get in the Abhidharma. These are concepts that also exist in the Sutta Pitaka. So we have these concepts of lightness, um, pliancy, and malleability, you know, which um, exist in the suttas. And the Pali words for these are Lahuta, Viduta, and Kamanyata. So I just wanted to share, first of all, an excerpt from a Pali Sutta to see how these concepts or words are used. So this is a reading from a Sutta called the Iron Ball Sutta, which describes um, how the Buddha um, travels with, you know, both a mind-made body and a body made out of the four elements to the Brahma world. So, you know, how does the Buddha cultivate meditation as a path to psychic mastery. And what the text says here is that, um, I'm just reading, 
Sometimes the realized one submerges his body in his mind and his mind in his body. He meditates after sinking into a perception of bliss and lightness in the body. Um, so in Pali, Sukha Sanya and Lahi Sanya. After that time, his body becomes lighter, softer, more workable and more radiant. So we can imagine already that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes we come into meditation and we might feel heavy or we might feel like even oppressed by a certain emotion. And, you know, we don't always have this perception of bodily lightness or, um, you know, softness or um, malleability. And the same for our minds. You know, actually, like if we've been anxious about something or depressed or, you know, if we're really craving something or very angry, our minds can become very um, heavy and also um, very inflexible and stubborn. <laughs> and, you know, when our minds are like heavy and inflexible and stubborn, we can't really do anything with them. They're very, um, you know, they're not workable. They're not malleable. So um, like any of us who have, you know, taken the effort to actually cultivate meditation, we know how much of a relief it is when, you know, we've had an experience of joy, um, which is called the Sukha Sanya here, the, the perception of happiness. And suddenly, you know, a lot of that weight that we felt we had previously, that weight that was, you know, that um, bodily weight, that psychological weight, um, we experiencing it. We experience it lifting through meditation, and you know this can be sometimes a very like somatic um, or physical thing. That you know when we normally when we sit meditation, we might think you know I can only sit for fifteen minutes and then my knees will start hurting. But once we have an experience of this lightness and pliancy, it might be that we can sit for two hours, three hours and not experience any physical pain. So when we have this experience, it's something that, you know, we really know about because, um, you know, just our whole physical experience of being in the world becomes very different. And for me personally, I have allergies. I have quite severe um, hay fever, actually. Uh, you know, I've, I've been through so many rounds of treatment for hay fever. And... Um, again, it's, it's something that can be quite obvious too to the person sitting next to me in the meditation hall because, you know, as soon as the meditation starts improving, I, I stop sneezing as much because the whole, you know, the whole system's calmed down. So these will be key words that we'll, we'll be taking um, with us this evening. So um, um, again, in Pali, that's Lahuta being lightness, Miduta being pliancy, and Kamanyata being male malleability, because these are really the entry points that we'll be using to have a look at some of these key themes from the Abhidharma that have, um, for whatever reason, um, really entered the way that, for example, the Thai tradition historically talks about meditation. Um, but, you know, how have, how have these terms actually entered meditation teaching? Actually, it's via the Abhidharma. Because obviously, until very recently, um, you know, <laughs> most of the, the Buddhism that was available um, was based on the Abhidharma. And, you know, you have these accounts of um, visitors to say Laos in the past. And, you know, they couldn't find any book in the temple um, except for the Abhidharma itself. Um, obviously, things are changing now. There's a lot more interest in the Sutta Pitaka. But to be able to under, understand um, the historical development, um, this is actually the pathway that things go through. Um, so some of the reflections I'll be sharing this evening are mostly taken from a book called the Abhidhamata Sangaha, which, um, for example, in countries like Burma is quite often used as a primer or an introduction to Abhidhamma. And this text was compiled um, by a Sri Lankan monk, Venerable Aniruddha, sometime between the 8th century and the 12th century. 
Um, so it's kind of like an Abhidharma um, treatise or Abhidharma introduction. It's not part of the Abhidharma itself. And, you know, obviously the reason why this book exists is because, you know, to approach the actual canonical Abhidharma can be quite difficult. This is meant to simplify it a little bit. And some of the material I'm going to be talking about today is also covered in the Dhammasangani, um, which is a book of the canonical Abhidharma, and the Atta Salini bit, which is Abhidharma commentary. Um, but I'll be mostly using the Abhidhamatta Sangaha version for today. Um, so to actually get to how these concepts of lightness, pliancy and malleability are treated in the Abhidharma, we need to have a look at some of the basic building blocks of the Abhidharma first. So we can think of these in terms of four syllables, which are chi, che, ru, and ni. So chi is chitters, of which there are 89 or 121 types. Um, so chitta being the, the mind. Che is chetasikas, of which there are 52 types. And chetasikas being those mental qualities that accompany um, you know, particular minds. Rupa being form, of which there are 28 types, and Nibbana obviously being Nibbana, of which there is one type. So where, where do these qualities, um, you know, the ones I mentioned previously, actually come into the Abhidharma? So if we look at these, these Chaitasikas, um, these mental factors, there are 52 of them, which can be broken down into a further um, three main groups according to their ethical character. So some of them are eth ethically variable. So they can be either good, they can be either bad, um, you know, they're not fixed. So these ones are called Anya Samana. And, you know, the next main group by group of three is the Akusala Chaitasikas, so the immoral ones. And then we have the wholesome ones, which are the Kusala ones. So of the ethically variable Chaitasikas, um, some of them are found in all, in all mental states, in all minds. So sadharana means shared, sabha means all. So sabachita sadharana means, you know, the chaitasikas, which are shared by all minds, of which there are seven. And we also have um, the spikinika chaitasikas, which are only found um, sometimes, they're not, not always there. Um, the akusala ones, the unwholesome ones, and the beautiful ones, which are defined by the absence of these immoral Akusla Chaitasikas. Um, so, I mean, there's no exam, so you can just let it wash over you. But these are, <laughs> you know, these are important concepts that, um, you know, some mental states are only found in wholesome mindsets and others are only found in unwholesome mindsets and some, depending on the circumstance, can be found in both. Okay. So if we have a look at these, um, these the seven um, mental factors that are found in all minds, we can see there are seven of them. So beginning from contact, feeling, perception, volition, um, concentration or one-pointedness, we have life faculty and attention. So in Pali, pasa, vedana, sanya, chaitna, ekagata, jivatindriya, and manasikara. And we can see that one of them is also um, a jhana factor, this ekagata. Um, but actually it's over here in the Abhidharma analysis because, you know, we need a degree of concentration 
you know, just to even function as human beings. Um, so, I mean, in, obviously it's quite different from the Sutta analysis, like there's no exact matching list for this set anywhere in the Suttas, but it's an important initial step to understand um, what's happening later when we look at the, you know, the beautiful um, Chaitasikas, the Sobhana Chaitasikas, um, which are the ones I'm really interested in for this evening. Okay, so we also have then um, six um, Bikinika Chaitasikas, the six, um, you know, miscellaneous ones that are sometimes present. So I should have put the English there, actually. I'm very sorry for not doing that. But we have um, Vitaka, which is the applied for it. So, it, you know, like a bee, um, when it first goes to the flower, that's um, the applied for it. When it circles around the flower, that's sustained for it. So that first um, movement towards a thought is called Vitaka, and the circling is called Vichara. Um, the next one is virya, which is energy. We have joy, piti, um, will, chanda, and uh, decision, which is adhimokkha. So actually, we can see, you know, some of these are also jhana factors. Um, but according to the Abhidharma analysis, you know, these ones aren't necessarily there in every mind. They're only there, you know, sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to move through a little bit quickly because this is just, um, you know, it's just overview to get to the point I want to actually make. Um, so, yeah, we have this concept of some of these um, chater stickers are there all of the time. Some of them are there some of the time. So pretty straightforward. And we then have 14 Akusala Chaitasikas. Um, you know, why are they Akusala? Because they have one of the three unwholesome roots as either being greed, hatred, or um, delusion, as either one of Loba, Dosa, Moha. But if we see the full list, actually, this list includes um, some concepts that are discussed in the Suttapitika as being Upakulesa or like. Um, kind of like secondary defilements. So to go through the list, these ones are the unethical ones. So the ones you, you don't want. So we have greed, hatred and delusion, or here we have the translation has dullness. Um, so these are obviously the three unwholesome roots. And we have um, ditti, which is like the, the views, the wrong views. Um, mana, which is conceit. Issa, envy, macharia, selfishness, kukucha, worry, ahirika, shamelessness, and anotapa, recklessness, wadicha, distraction, tina, sloth, midda, torpor, and vichikicha, which is doubt or perplexity. So actually, maybe some of these are familiar to you as well, because some of them are also hindrances. So actually, we can see that um, Udicha number 11 and Kukucha are also um, one of the five hindrances, if you're familiar with that scheme. And Tina and Mitta are also hindrances. And, you know, if we were to really look, I'm sure you could actually find all five of the hindrances um, somewhere there. In this scheme. For example, um, Kamachanda would be covered under Loba, so like sense desire would be covered under greed. And the hindrance of um, Vyapada, which is ill will, would be covered under Dosa, which is hate. So, you know, I may have mentioned previously, I, I don't really remember what I talked about, um, although I'm guessing I may have talked about the hindrances because I talk about the hindrances a lot. But the hindrances are those, those things which basically stop us succeeding in meditation. 
So some people think, actually, you know, I can't succeed in my meditation because I, I lack paramis or I can't succeed in my meditation because, you know, my life is too busy. Actually, uh, um, the Buddha said the real reason we can't succeed in our meditation was the five hindrances. So, um, you know, whether you have a uh, parami or not, that's like, that's not the issue. The issue is the hindrances. So all of them are actually hanging out in this, in this list of 14 Akusala um, Jata Sikhas. And my note there says uh, no beautiful Chaita Sikhas occur in immoral consciousness, um, which, which is a technical point because next we'll be talking about the next class of Chaita Sikhas, which um, are the remedy to some of these, um, these Akusala Chaita Sikhas, but you know, even on a, on a non-technical level. Um, actually, we can see how that's like intuitively correct because these states, um, they're not beautiful states. Like if we have any of them, you know, we're going to be feeling probably a little bit uncomfortable. So um, that's what I meant by that note there. Okay, moving on. Uh -huh. So this is what I really wanted to talk about. Um, actually, this is the whole reason why I have this whole discussion of um, Chaita Sikhas in this um, PDF. Um, so we have this concept of 25 Sobhana Chaita Sikhas. So we've just talked about um, Chaita Sikhas, which, you know, are always there. Um, what are called the Sabachitta Sintarana Chaita Sikhas. Chaita Sikhas, which is sometimes there. The Pekinika Chaita Sikhas, we talked about the ones that are there in unethical mind states, and we call those ones the Akusala Chaita Sikhas. So now um, we're going to talk about the last group, which is the beautiful Chaita Sikhas, so the Sobhana Chaita Sikhas. So um, basically, these ones are defined by the absence of unwholesome mental factors. Um, so there are 25 of them, and among them, um, 19 of them are present in all beautiful minds. And I thought, actually, this is kind of like, that's very poetic. Um, I, I like this way of putting it, that you have this like analysis of what a beautiful mind is like, according to Abhidharma. Um, because, you know, personally, when I think of Abhidharma, I don't really think of qualities like, um, you know, beauty or um, meditation practice. I think maybe of lists and having to, um, you know, uh, learn lots of complicated and boring things. So, um, so this is like, um, you know, the, the, um, <laughs> the analysis of beautiful minds according to Abhidharma. Okay, so the first, um, you know, the first feature which we can see in beautiful um, mental states is that they are always ethical. So we have that, um, it's up pretty close to the start of the list. These states are always accompanied by Hiri and Otapa. So Hiri being model moral shame or modesty and Otapa being moral dread or fear of blame. So here he is more like the modesty we have um, ourselves because we think, you know, I have this level of education, I'm this sort of person, I shouldn't do something wrong. And Otapa is more about our role in society that, um, you know, other people might blame us if we do a bad thing. So the seven of these, they start from um, Sadda being faith. So faith here being the foundation of good qualities. Um, and there's a very nice Burmese saying actually that says, you know, the Buddha's teachings are like a mountain of gems. Faith is the hand that lets you take the gems. 
So unless we have faith, you know, it's very hard to actually even begin to access the other good qualities. And we have sati, which is mindfulness. The Buddha said that mindfulness is always helpful. And in addition to these qualities, um, we also have um, aloba, which is non-greed, and adosa, which is non-hatred. And this very unusual word, we have this word, um, tatra, majja, tata. Actually, that should be a long A. Um, when you have these ta endings in Pali, they indicate something has the quality. Um, you know, so here it means um, having the quality of middleness, majatata, there, i.e., with respect to objects. So this long, funny-looking word, tatra majatata, is actually a synonym for ipeka, which is even-mindedness. Um, so we can see that actually the opposite of some of these um, negative roots are included. Okay. So I'm just going to keep moving through because what I wanted to really get to was the similes. So in addition to the um, these mental states that are always there in beautiful minds there are six of them the six pairs and these were the yukalas i was mentioning earlier that have um you know become historically important for um, certain types of meditation teaching so these ones are sometimes there in beautiful um you know in beautiful mental states so the ones that are sometimes there begin from pasadi. And I talked about pasadi last time as being tranquility. You know, so our minds calm down, our bodies calm down. And, you know, we feel comfortable, we feel cool. And that's why the simile here is that the chief characteristic of um, pasadi has the character, you know, it's characterized by suppression or the allaying of feverishness of passions. So when we want things, you know, our body becomes quite agitated. Um, we have to get up and do stuff. Um, you know, it's nearly like burning sometimes. Like if you don't like someone, like you mightn't be able to sleep. And actually, you know, we go through, we can, it's very easy to go through the whole day with this like continuous sense of discomfort because, um, you know, for whatever reason, we might be taking some degree of anxiety um, to what should really be like um, basic social interactions, like maybe interacting with our family or going to work. Um, but when we practice meditation, we can actually, um, you know, let go of some of that anxiety and take a more calm and collected um, body and mind, you know, to the work we're doing or to our family relationships. And I have a picture of a tree there. So um, the simile here being it's like the cool shade of a tree to a person affected by the sun's heat. So the sun's heat standing for, um, I mean, in the context of Abhidharma, maybe it would stand for these um, unwholesome mental states. Um, but, you know, in the context of sutta, it could stand for the hindrances. And the comment here says that basadi, this calmness, is opposed to um, udicca, which means restlessness or excitement. When highly developed, it becomes a factor of enlightenment, um, one of the bajangas that I mentioned last time. So we can see in the picture, I think these are geese, and you know, they're all hanging out in the shade. And we know what shade's like. It's, you know, when you get to a proper big shady tree, it's the middle of summer, you just want to pop down there and be comfortable. So, I mean, that's what meditation can do. It can just give us a, a place that's, um, you know, a refuge where the hindrances just aren't there. Okay, so the next, um, the next one 
of these ukulas of these six pairs of what are known as chater stickers um, is lightness and the Pali word for this being lahuta. So it's derived from the word lagu, meaning light or quick. So lahuta is buoyancy or lightness. So it suppresses the heaviness of the mind and the mental factors as its chief characteristic. It is like the laying down of a heavy burden. So I got this picture of a turtle and, you know, this poor turtle, I think it's holding up like concrete or something. And, you know, I put, I put it there to be funny and cute, but actually this is what we do to ourselves when we're holding on, um, you know, to the hindrances. And we might think, oh, you know, I, I need to worry about this or, um, you know, I, I need to be angry at that person or, you know, I, I really need this new thing or I need the promotion. But actually, you know, what we're doing to ourselves by having this type of identification with the hindrances um, you know, it's like we're volunteering. It's like we're putting our hands up saying, you know, yes, you know, I put the cement on my back, you know, <laughs> yes, um, I, I want to be crushed under a load of bricks. But actually these things are always choices. You know, no one's standing over us, forcing us to worry about anything. Um, you know, all of the, the, the worry, um, it's just like the self-harm that we actually, we, we do to ourselves. Uh, you know, no matter what problems we have in life, none of them are actually improving um, because we're worrying about them. Actually, the only thing we're doing most of the time is just, um, you know, making things worse for ourselves. So this quality of Lahuda is like if that, if that poor turtle, you know, just one day decided to walk free and get the cement up its back. So what happens when we lay down our burdens, when we, you know, when we make that decision mentally, that, you know, no matter what, um, I'm just, I'm not going to get into that worry cycle. Um, it's like laying down the burden. And, you know, we feel lighter, we feel freer. And the text is saying that um, this quality of lightness is opposed to Tina and Midtha, which is the Pali for sloth and torpor, which causes heaviness and rigidity in mental factors and consciousness. Um, you know, so I, I don't need to tell you what it thinks, feels like, you know, you can think of what it was like maybe one time when you went to the beach and you didn't have to worry about anything. Um, I've never been to Malaysia. I, I don't know if you have nice beaches there, but I lived on the Gold Coast and, you know, we have these very beautiful, um, like very long sandy beaches like surface paradise. So to me, that's a very um, clear image of you know, of just going on holiday and just letting everything go. So, I mean, that's what meditation um, can offer, just the, um, the lightness and mental freedom. Okay, so continuing to move through. So the next quality here is mudita. So mudita being the pliancy or tender, tender, tenderness so the chief characteristic of mudita is the suppression of stiffness and resistance. It removes stiffness and becomes pliable in receiving objects. So the analogy here, it's like if you um, moisturize your skin by applying maybe some moisturizer, um, you know, it becomes softer. And the text is saying that this characteristic of the mental softness um, you know, it opposes the false views and conceit, um, Pali dhikti and mana, which cause stiffness. And even in English, we have these kind of um, like concepts of being a stiff necked person or, you know, like even we have the word rigid to apply someone to, sorry, to describe someone whose mind um, just isn't very flexible. And obviously these things, um, you know, meditation helps to open us up and to make us, um, you know, more, more open um, and, and receptive to things like the noble truths, to things like the truth of impermanence, that when we hold on to our views very rigidly and to our, you know, to our ego ideas, um, 
we, we can't see them because, you know, we want to be the important person. We want to be the center of the universe. And unless we're in a receptive mind state, um, you know, sometimes our, our stiffness and our pride, um, it, it, it stops us from seeing these things. Okay, so getting towards the end. So the next one is Kamanyata, which means malleability. So what's its chief characteristic? So it suppresses the unworkableness of consciousness and its factors. It is like heated metal made fit for any use, and it is opposed to all the remaining hindrances. So again, even in the Satipitaka, we have this very clear analogy of, um, you know, the mind that's been developed through meditation being like um, gold that's been heated. And after it's been heated, you know, all of the impurities have been removed. Actually, it's only then that it's really, that we're really able to do things with it. Um, so very vivid image. So next one is Bhagunyata. So this means health of body and mind. Um, and here also meaning proficiency or, or skillfulness. So when our minds, you know, when they have a bit of strength, they can overcome um, things like um, lack of faith. Okay, uh, next one is Ujukata, meaning uprightness of mind. So this is, um, you know, it's moral uprightness. So being opposed to crookedness, deception, and craftiness. And to finish off here, um, just to finish off all of the beautiful mental factors, we have three mental factors which relate to, uh, you know, our morality, our sila. So we have right action, samakamanta, right speech, samawacha, and right livelihood, which is sama ajiva. And we also have two limitless chaitasikas, namely karuna and medita. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a legitimate question to ask, like, why aren't the rest of the Bama Viharas here? Why do we only have two? And that's because the other two um, Brahma Viharas were covered earlier. Um, that being said, the commentary is a little bit in two minds about this whole thing. And um, because you end up with this, um, <laughs> um, this kind of contradiction where we earlier, where we said that Ipeka was always there and, you know, the commentaries want to know how can we have Ipeka at the same time as Karuna and Mudita. And I think personally, that's quite a reasonable question for the commentaries to ask. Um, so I'm just, you know, I just want to present the scheme. Um, I, I'm not trying to argue that it's perfect. I'm just trying to um, explain how, how these particular terms have entered discourse around meditation within the Theravada world. Okay, so we have two Apamanyas, two limitless Chodasikas, and the very last one, last but not least, is wisdom, which is Panya. Okay, so um, I went through that a lot more quickly than I was expecting. No, a lot more slowly than I was expecting to. I was hoping to get a little bit further, but I'm going to have to um, wrap up here and open up to questions because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, so, um, like if you were ever wondering um, what these three terms mean, um, now you know. So that's why these particular terms um, sometimes show up um, in books about meditation. So I'm going to hand it back to Sister Vivian for questions, um, if that's okay. Yes, 
Thank you, Aya. So right now we'll go for questions and I realize there are certain questions that have been posted from our from our viewers here tonight. So I'll be just reading some of those today. Um, so we have one which was earlier. Um, I just had my booster vaccination as I was feeling very unwell physically. I visited the doctors and I tried listening to the Dharma, practiced mindfulness and other methods. However, I could not ease the physical ailments. So can Aya give me any suggestions? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's great that you were able to access the booster. Um, I haven't been able to access mine yet. Um, I'm still waiting, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it at the end of January. Okay, so you've gone to the doctors, you tried listening to the Dhamma and practicing mindfulness and other methods, um, but you couldn't ease the physical aim ailments. So, um, I mean, that's okay, because if you have pains in your body, that's, that's fine. Like, um, you know, the, the pains are natural, just let them stay as long as they want. Because when you're trying to control the stuff that's going on in your body, um, actually, that's already a bit of restlessness there. And, you know, even that, that act of like wishing, you know, I wish my body was some way other than it is at the moment, you know, that's already craving. So um, however your body wants to be, that's okay. Just, just let it be painful. Let it be icky. Like it's, it's, it's really fine. And what will happen is that maybe when you're not expecting it, um, you know, when that craving, you know, I wish I had a different body when that's gone. Um, that's when actually you might start to experience more of the relaxation response where because of the lack of restlessness, actually there is a, um, you know, like a degree of relaxation that's helping to calm, um, whether it's the pain or, you know, helping to calm even the inflammation response to some degree. So, yeah, um, if your body feels icky, uh, <laughs> just make peace with it. It'll, it'll be fine. Um, I hope that helps. Thank you. And the next question we have, uh, when we experience some pity during meditation, should we focus on the pity or should we be aware of the other experiences? Thank you. Um, thanks so much for asking that question. Um, so should you focus on the PT? So I think it, it depends on what you mean by um, focus. Because sometimes, like it is possible to do this thing where we start craving um, for the joy. And I mean, I, I know personally for me, this has just always been a huge issue that um, sometimes it's like trying to get water from rock, you know, because you come into meditation and your mind's like a rock and you start, um, it's possible to get a little bit demanding with it. Like, um, you know, hey, you meditation, you must make me happy. You know, I, I, went, I went to all of this effort to come and sit down and, you know, I'm going to demand some happiness right now. So, I mean, if it's that type of focus, obviously that's a bad thing. <laughs> um, but when, when the meditation object, when it brightens up and when the breathing develops some joy naturally, there's going to be a point where it's impossible not to focus on the PD because it's the nature of joy um, to actually suck you in. If it's a joyful object, you know, um, that quality will, it'll attract the mind and hold the mind. So, like if it were me, I wouldn't go looking for it deliberately. Um, but once it's there, it's going to be quite hard to ignore because that will be, um, you know, it'll be a pleasant mental sensation. So, um, you know, not many people would actually want to ignore a, a pleasant mental sensation. It's going to be naturally very attractive to the mind. Um, like... Sometimes, like, there is this thing where it's possible for meditators to want to progress too quickly as well. And if you find that's happening to you too, um, it can be um, good just to make sure that the mindfulness of breathing um, is very solidly established um, first. So, like, if you do have a tendency, um, you know... <laughs> Like if you, you watch the breath, the breath becomes beautiful and then suddenly after that you lose mindfulness. Um, you know, just making sure that basic mindfulness is there can actually um, help to give things a little bit of time to build first. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I've just, I've gone on a bit of a tangent. 
Um, but to progress towards jhana, um, actually that's a good thing, right? Because the object of the jhana is the piti sukha. So eventually, you know, that will be the predominant focus of the mind in meditation. And that's a, that's a great thing. Okay. All right. Uh, and then the last question that we have here tonight by David. So in the West today, is Buddhism being accepted widely there? Okay, I can't speak for the whole West, David. Um, in Australia, we have a 2% Buddhist population. Um, so of that 2% Buddhist population, about one third are Vietnamese background migrants. The remainder are a mix of like migrants from Sri Lanka, Malaysia, as well as converts from non-traditional Buddhist backgrounds. So um, I'd say it, it depends where you go. In the major cities, um, Buddhism has quite a good reputation because, um, you know, people perceive Buddhism as being a relatively peaceful religion. I mean, in the rural areas, it can be a little bit different um, and people may have more outdated stereotypes. Um, but, you know, personally, I find it quite okay to be a Buddhist nun in Sydney. Thank you so much, Aya. So I think with that, that's all for the questions that we have from our audience tonight. And I will, uh, we will now proceed with the Anumodana. So over to you. Okay, wonderful. So sharing all of the merits um, from this evening's talk and, you know, rejoicing in all of the Kusala Karma that we've all made by contemplating um, the wholesome and the unwholesome and the path, and the path to Nirvana. So I'll do the chanting. Akasata cha bhummata deva naga mahitika punyantang anamoditwa chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasata cha bhummata deva naga mahitika punyantang anamoditwa chirang rakantu desanang. Akasata cha bhummata deva naga mahitika Thank you so much to Aya Sivira and also thank you to all our audiences for your time tonight. Thank you for listening and joining us as we all learn the Dharma together with Aya Sivira tonight. And for all the viewers and to all our sponsors, thank you so much for your kind donation as well. And on behalf of the monks and the Committee of Management of Buddhist Mahavihara, we would like to thank all of you. We wish all of you a pleasant and safe evening. Sukihotu. Okay, Sukihotu. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.